Well, uh, might as well get started. Hello. <laughs> Hi. So we're the concept club at VCU. Mm-hmm. We are just a small bunch of people who get together on Fridays and try to do more, draw more, and really aiming towards the <laughs> entertainment industry, trying to get into concept club. I mean, concept art. <laughs> and um, today we have our amazing guest, Nicholas Cole here. I know that's Happy Rock. He's worked on such amazing, like, really good titles, like um, Shardbound recently and uh, Lucky Fox's Tale. And today he's going to be sharing some awesome information about us, how about himself and the industry. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, so uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to hear what you have to say. Definitely. No, glad to do it. All right. So let's kick it off with the first question. Um, for the people that who are more unfamiliar with your work, can you give us a small overview on like the types of projects you've worked on and what you've done within the industry? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, so, anyways, yeah. So I uh, I went to the Rhode Island School of Design um, and I graduated in like 2009, did a degree in illustration. Um, Right off the bat, I got a, a gig uh, with a company called 38 Studios, which they were, um, it's kind of been a pattern with me, actually. I, I tend to link up with companies uh, shooting to unseen, already set industry giants uh, right ahead of their own collapse. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I was trying to make the next World of Warcraft that was going to destroy World of Warcraft. Um, <laughs> it didn't work out. A company collapsed in a sort of terrific ball of flight reacts tax dollars almost. Um, that was really cool because I got to cut my teeth on sort of the design and concept of her in a context where there were a lot of artists who were helping review it. Um, so 38 Studios was the first gig. Um, like I said, that collapsed, uh, but I got a lot of really cool mentorship out of that, and that was a, a really great experience. And what happens with studios like that when you group together with a bunch of people who are super talented, and then things don't go so hot, which uh, honestly happens kind of frequently in, in a lot of different creative industries. Um, my most recent analogy for it has been that it's a bit like the um, the poof of a, of a dandelion when you poof, you blow on it and all the seeds just they scatter to the four corners and they plant other new little dandelions and now you have a whole field of flowers um, and the reality is that all those incredibly talented people now spread and they go out to other studios and find work elsewhere and now you have this whole network of connections kind of everywhere and so like the weird path of like people finding me and me finding them like I'm still working with people from that time and that was almost 10 years ago um, so yeah so 38 studios and and that was a, a very galvanizing experience for me that was a uh, I thought that I really wanted to work for a big studio full-time and in-house for me that lesson and a couple sort of little informative things especially on the East Coast because I'm still on East Coast based Rhode Island um, a lot of the games industry and stuff like that was trying to grow here and then started to sort of tumble down and, and fall apart um, and so I watched all that happen. I watched people leap from 38 Studios to like Zynga, which like I don't even know if there is any version of Zynga in the world anymore. But um, but they were they were a big hot shot. They like had us all in for interviews, and they were like, I'll never forget. They had this moment in the interview where they were like, Well, as long as you, I mean, like trust us, we have money. So like as long as you don't charge like lawyer rates, you know, like anything over a hundred dollars an hour. And I was like, Oh, cool. So ninety nine dollars an hour, <laughs> uh, like quietly in the back of my head. Uh, I never did wind up working with them, which is good because I collapsed a few months later. Um, <laughs> surprising with their financial policies, they really seemed steady. Um, and so Zynga was, was uh, like a thing that was, anyways, the industry over in the East kind of collapsed a little bit. Um, and watching that happen, I realized that I was going to need to sort of cultivate a lifestyle and a way of approaching this that was flexible. Um, and so I started to reach out for freelance opportunities. Um, so the, one of the first things that happened there was I did a little time at Hasbro, which is locally based. Um, so I've worked with the, a couple different teams at Hasbro. I went in a couple of years later and did a few years on the Play-Doh team. So for like a solid year, year and a half, I was just sitting on the floor like playing with Play-Doh, like <laughs> doing literal concept art with Play-Doh for Play-Doh related entertainment and properties and stuff like that that they're hoping to develop. Um, which was just like crazy. Like you never could have imagined that was like a job you could have. Like be the guy who like 
they just gave me like a whole arm full of, of Play-Doh cans and I balled my, my cube off and then just sat there uh, sort of rolling little balls and sculpting little creatures and stuff like that. People come over and peek over the giant poster of Elmo that was like creating a barrier. I was like, no, you, this is my space now. And they said, excuse me. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> the crazy little feral kid in the corner. Um, so that was a great gig for, for the time that that was, uh, that was going on. Um, I popped around. I, one of the first uh, sort of illustrated book freelance gigs I did was The Curse of Maleficent when the, the Angelina Jolie movie was coming out with Disney. Did some illustration with that. I met Regan um, shortly somewhere around the... Um, hey, dude. <laughs> uh, somewhere around that era. I mean, actually... I should probably tell that backstory too. I mean, I've been stalking Regan online since the days of Live Journal, um, so I, I was getting my like industrial music recommendations by watching like what's he listening to, um, <laughs> and tracking his uh, his post-apocalyptic furry art at the time. Like, let's do this. Um, and uh, and that's such a funny thing because then we both wound up. Oh, this is, I, don't know, I interrupt. Um, we both wound up at the Flight Anthology, which was rad. Yeah. Like, totally rad. Dream come true. Got to sort of work alongside a bunch of my heroes, um, like Regan, uh, and uh, like just got to, to come up with my own story, develop that entirely on my own, and sort of have these like incredible mentors and voices speaking into that process, which was amazing. Um, so comics like kind of have always been a, another thread. So the the toy thing, the video game thing, the books like Maleficent kind of came out of comics a little bit, and then that I've had a running sort of contact with Disney, and I've done a couple books with them, done a, a bunch of Play Doh stuff, <laughs> done some comics. I worked on a project called Dawn Gate uh, for a little while, which was like a, a MOBA that was going to unseat League of Legends, and you know how that went. Um, we dethrone them, and they are no more, of course. And I have League, the head of... I can't show you with the camera, but the head of League of Legends is, is mounted on my wall. There. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we, you know, we were making mobile characters, and right in the middle of all that, uh, they realized they wanted to sort of suture some story into their MOBA, which I don't know if you guys play MOBA games, League of Legends, uh, Dota, or whatever. Uh, not, not very story heavy. Definitely, like, a lot of lore tucked away in the forums, uh, and they were one of the first ones to be like, hey, let's do some comics. Like, So for a while, uh, for about the better part of a year, like nine months, uh, I was doing uh, sort of uh, three pages a week with my buddy John, and we were producing web comics for this MOBA, which was a, another a total dream gig. Um, I was being paid like a, like a video game kind of retainer <laughs> to make comics, which is really rare, because uh, comics are a, a labor of love at the best of times um, in terms of pay. So, so that was really cool. Since then, I've been freelancing for a bunch of different clients and some right now that I can't uh, can't tell you about, but I really want to. Um, <laughs> Lucky's Tale was one of them. That was a really fun gig. Uh, I am just launched my own Patreon for my personal project, Jellybots, which is kind of a follow-up. Yay! <laughs> in the spirit of some of the stuff I was doing with Flight, I just wanted to to continue to develop my own stories, my own worlds, and, and uh, work towards something in that arena, and, and kind of uh, take that further. So that's been that's been amazing. That's been a really cool thing. And so I'm doing that alongside a couple other. You know, I'm taking on a bunch of other contract work. Um, the Wing Feather Saga right now. We're trying to pitch a, a show. Um, so I'm the production designer on that right now, where I'm trying to I'm doing character design and environment design and color scripting and drawing over 3D models and telling people what they did wrong and um, red light. It's, uh, it's that's a fun gig too. So I, I, I could go on. I'm sorry. It's a huge rambling list of things. Um, the nature of freelance is that there's always going to be like a ton of things you do, and for me the, that that that's been really life giving. Like I'm I. I drink its life force. Um, I need variety, and I need. Uh, I, I think I get really bored if I'm um, too. If I'm mono eating artistically, you know. Um, uh, so having the ability to to mix it up on the regular and just keep moving and do a little Play-Doh and then a little like dark fantasy and then a little bit of comics and a little bit of this um, has been uh, just really great. Really enjoyed that. 
Cha 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 so that's actually really really cool um really funny how you started out in play-doh and now you're like this like massive inspiration to most concept artists out there and that you were actually inspired by our buddy here reagan um, yeah <laughs> one other question is uh you mentioned a lot of the work and studios that you work for can we ask what it's like to be part of such a production and the role you played in like what was it like working for lucky's tale or shardbound which is also something you were really well known for um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, so uh, each one is a completely different animal, right? And and some of these span different industries, right? So Play-Doh was a, a totally inter interesting, different experience because I was in Hasbro Studios, sitting on a floor, <laughs> smelling Play-Doh, <laughs> trying not to eat it um, on the regular. And so, and I did, and it's salty and it's awful. Um, and so that was really like a, a cool experience in some ways because it had the regularity of an office job and I was like kind of coming in often and, and working with the team in person. Um, but for instance, Shardbound is a completely different thing. So for Shardbound, um, so the Dawngate team, so the Dawngate project, uh, after we killed League of Legends and succeeded, uh, it <laughs> fell apart and was canceled by EA. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they all, once again, dandelion scattering, um, and formed a bunch of the core team there, formed a new studio, and they started making Shardbound. And so that's how I wound up on that project. Um, and uh, I think it's in the, the public forums now. Shardbound's on rocky ground as well, which is a shame. But um, uh, but they may, they, they, they're a pretty scrappy crew, and I think they might pull out of it, which is good. But it's a tough industry for these things. Um, so Shardbound's just like, you know, these people that I really liked to work with from 38 Studios, one of them went to the Dawngate team, and they said, hey, Nick, come on. And I was like, oh, okay, I know you're good, and I know I like you. So I'm going to come do a little, I'm going to test this out, and then found out I liked it, met a bunch of new people that I really liked working with there, did that for a couple of years, and then when they that fell apart and they went on to their new thing, uh, to Shardbound, um, we had this friendship and a relationship, and I was like, "Oh man, I gotta work with Dibs and Hunter, and like we've we've got to do this." Some people I know only by their usernames, um, which is part of the nature of the gig. We're all online, and it's just like, "Oh yeah, Dibs and Baby Cat, like those are my coworkers." Um, until you like go and and like stay with them for a week in San Francisco because you're working on some part of the project, and you're like, "So your name's William, like <laughs> not Baby Cat, like that." That's a weird one. Um, yeah, so it's just, Shardown's been a, a project that, uh, I don't know if you guys, you guys know what Slack is, the program Slack or the, yep. So that's been a huge game changer for how these things come together in terms of, of managing teams online. Um, so Slack is sort of a, a f sort of closed forum where Shardbound is is sort of happening, and you can pull people aside and have little chats, and then have a big group chat, post your art in the channel. And uh, that project's been super cool because they pulled in a lot of other really talented concept artists from like Points International, um, and uh, and so I met a lot of people there. I wound up in Poland this last year because I work on the iPad Pro and I use Procreate and the company makes Procreate was like want to come to Poland and I was like heck yes I do and when I was in Poland this guy Mads was there and he's like we're from Shardbound together and I was like oh the internet um, so that was just that was insane in and of itself um, but you're making all these these cool connections. So it's this weird abstract experience of like working alone in coffee shops or in your undies, like from <laughs> your apartment, and um, and then winding up like finally meeting your coworkers when you're like sleeping on their couch or you're like off in Poland somewhere. <laughs> they happen to be at the same like arts conference or whatever. Um, so working online is a strange. It's kind of a, there's not. I don't think a, like a lot of people are are prepped or like teaching about what that's like or what that entails because that just didn't exist for our parents generation um so i'm, I'm very internet positive um i would not be here if not for the <laughs> here with you um if not for the the internet and for those connections and and that's been a huge driving force between just getting work and continuing to get my work out there and connecting with new people um i'm engaged i met that 
woman, <laughs> that woman, <laughs> I met that woman, uh, I met her on Instagram, like, you know, Reagan sent me my, this Apple Pencil, oh, yeah. I'm going out, <laughs> he sent me this, you guys know about this? Yeah. We've never met. This is the first I've actually like seen him move. <laughs> this is the first like like animating Reagan I've ever seen. Yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, <laughs> I don't think I've seen like you move or talk in real time before either, so it's kind of a first for me too. Weird. Hi. <laughs> uh, with that being the case, um, I was trying to get into the iPad Pro and realized there was like a, a couple months when like these were like unavailable anywhere. And I guess your guys' like campus store had like ten in like a dusty box somewhere, just like <laughs> hanging out. And Ring was like, "Oh, dude, you want one of these?" I was like, "What?" <laughs> um, yeah, yes, like very desperately, yes. Um, and so I think I still have the. Oh, I think the. His sketch is somewhere, I think it's in the other room. Uh, he sent me uh, a sketch of a, a post-apocalyptic wolf warrior with like a levitating iPad pencil. Uh, he was like, for you. <laughs> that was like the great, one of the greatest internet connection experiences ever. It was like this guy who like followed from Elfwood, elfwood.lysader.com, I think. Yeah. was a website that existed before DeviantArt that none of you babies know about. So you should uh, you should way back machine that or, or try and find, try and try <laughs> try ancient work out of Reagan. That would be a fun, oh, fun game. Was it good? Uh, I feel like I lost track of this question. Uh, <laughs> I'll ask another one. Go ahead, Anna. Yeah. That's, that's really funny. We'll have to uh, pester him about that. <laughs> um, yes. So you mentioned that pretty much uh, right after you graduated, you went to work for uh, 38 Studios. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about your journey from the beginning of post-grad life to getting your first job and beyond? Was it pretty much immediately? Was there a little bit of a gap? And if there were, um, what were some difficulties or some really positive things that happened? And what would you wish you could go back and tell yourself um, about that process now, because I know a lot of us are about to graduate and we're looking at that post grad life. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a precipice, sure. That's a scary moment for some people. For me, it was too. Um, yeah, let's see. I mean, being real, like, uh, that transition was a pretty difficult one for me. Um, and that was something that I, I really, I had a, a really incredible college experience. Like I, I had a group of friends and peers who were really driven and making art and really inspiring. Um, and I just sort of thrived in that environment. Um, what graduation can mean for a lot of you and has meant for a lot of my friends and younger friends that I've, I've had over the years as they've gone through it as well, is a period of a sort of like a sudden silence uh, kind of that feeling of like walking home from a party um, where you're like, what happened? <laughs> um, and it can be it can be pretty rough to sort of make that that leap. And I would say, you know, be patient with yourself. Um, be patient with that process. Like that's going to be a big adjustment. You're going to have to um, to, to figure out for me like things like just point out my my level of you know college privilege at the time was like you know who buys the toilet paper now is that is that me I oh no oh like I had a, a moment right that summer after of standing in the bread aisle of a grocery store and just having like a complete like existential meltdown just like what is good bread like which one is the right bread. I don't know. Every bread is telling you like, oh, I'm seven grain and I have 12 grains and I'm gluten free and I'm egg beaten. You know, it's like, I don't even, I, I was completely paralyzed because there's, there's, uh, 
in school and in life before that, you have like this linear progression of decisions, right? You have like, well, what, what would you like? Would you like choice A, B, or C? This class or that class? This school or that school? And so you have these slightly more binary or at least more closed decisions that you're making. And once you're in those systems, school says, okay, well, the next thing you do is you go to this grade and you succeed in, by this metric in grades. You'll be graded as you go. And, um, once you move out of that space, that's not in the, that's not, that's not the case anymore, really. I mean, you can choose certain systems that will help you, you know, sort of adjust. Um, but freelance life is like the opposite of that. It's just, it's choice paralysis. And I think that's something that we have as a, my generation and, and y'all's, if there's a, a difference at this point, for sure, starting to emerge, I think it's even an increase in the sense of like paralysis over choice. There's just so many options and so many people you can be, so many things you can do. The internet has opened up like everything. Um, and so I think, you know, the ways like, Find ways that you can create limits for yourself. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been encouraged to paint with like a, a limited palette. Um, uh, you know, just sort of constraining your colors to like just a few things. Um, find like helpful, helpful ways to create like a structure to get transition you into a broader space. I think that would be something I, I needed at the time was like a, a way of understanding like, all right, how can I how can I pick a bread um, and feel comfortable with that that decision moving forward? Um, and that goes for career stuff too. You know, it's like not every decision you make from here is a forever decision. Um, I thought Thirty Eight Studios was too big to fail a forever track by picking video games for a little while. I thought, well, this is me now, and now I've begun. I've hit the first domino in a series of dominoes that's going to put me on a, the path to a video game career. And in a sense, that that's true. But you wake up every day and you make a new decision. Um, and every single day of every single year that goes, like you're able to shift that trajectory. And your decisions will accumulate and you will be able to, to steer that ship. Um, and so you have more, more control than you think. Um, not everything is permanent. So the, you know, and like f a seeming failure right out of college is like not the end of the world at all. Um, I was really lucky and I got a job right out of the gate. My friend, a close friend and roommate, Brandon, he was my roommate because his mom co-signed the lease for him. He had no job. He was just like, I, I have nowhere to go right now. I, he applied at the same time. Here's a story for students. We uh, we had the guys from 38 Studios at the time, Hot Shots from you know originally LA came into town, um, and uh, and they did portfolio reviews at our school. And I've never seen anybody do this, and it's terrifying. So see, see if you can put yourself in the shoes here. Uh, they gave a presentation, uh, sort of like this, right? And then they were like, "All right, let's do portfolio reviews. Circle up. Let's do it." The entire class circled up. They pulled one gladiator into the middle of the arena and were like, put it down, let's do this. And what I had everybody watched as they gave everybody's consecutive portfolio review, which was brutal. Um, so ones that went well, went well in front of everybody, and ones that went poorly, went poorly in front of everybody. Um, my buddy Brandon had an 11 by 17 portfolio with eight and a half by 11 pieces in it. So the moment he opened his portfolio, his work went sliding across the floor. Rookie, rookie mistake, right? Like real simple stuff, right? That that interview ended pretty much there. Pretty much that was it. They were like, "All right, cool. When you're ready, um, why don't you come back some other time?" Uh, and that was pretty rough. So Brandon wound up moving in with no job with me uh, after school and just busted his butt on ZBrush stuff, on concept work. Um, used whatever savings he had, whatever his parents were willing to support him for, you know, uh, during that time for probably about six months, used like our connection. And I was like trying to help out in whatever way I could. He's working for uh, telltale now full time, um, out in LA full time gig, wound up at 38 studios. One of the most talented sculptors I know he's a character lead at telltale. Um, so that like missed, 
stair, you know, like when you sort of skip a stair going down, and you're like, whoa, you know, like that, you could recover very easily from that if you have the will. Um, there's no... Some of my friends just went off and took a, took a year to just chill, you know? I know one, one artist I really admire just went off to, like, bake. She was just a baker for, like, a couple of years, kind of doing commission work in her spare time. And in some senses, I just, like, I was like, that's my hero. Like, she... She was content and and knew who she was, knew what she wanted, was okay with not like getting immediately on this like spinning bicycle of career building. Um, and was just like, you know what? I I can sustain my life this way. I want to go do that, and I want to go figure out what it is I want to do next on my own terms and in my own time. Um, and that's open to you too. So there's not like one way to do this. Um, and that's what I think I would want to want to hear, and that's what I think I want you guys to hear too. But. but that's really cool to hear, and like really helpful because I'm sure a lot of us are just like, oh, uh, a little <laughs> anxious. So that's, yeah. uh, it's definitely uh, reassuring, and it's a nice positive thing. Yeah, and um, going on to that, going on from that, actually, I wanted to ask about um, further after your graduation onto creating your series Jelly Bots. Um, <coughs> I wanted to ask, how is it like creating your own IP and trying to ship it as much as you are? And what are your opinions on Patreon and how it's kind of like changing the game for artists? Mm. That's great. Yeah. Um, let's get into that. Uh, can you yeah. kill my voice? One second. Got it. Kill it. Oh, and we're good. All right. Cool. Uh, yeah. I heard it from somebody. I was talking to somebody else saying that um, right now... Oh, excuse me. Hey, we're talking about Brian Lee O'Malley. You guys know uh, Scott Pilgrim? Yes. yes. Uh, I think he gave an interview. I'm hearing this like through a friend about an interview they watched um, where he talked about how hard it is to have an idea of your own these days um, with the internet sort of having evolved the way it has and having this constant feed of people with their own ideas and perspectives, but it also being this like rushing stream and it's very hard to like make a space and have a perspective and hold that. Um, I think the internet in the days of places like Elfwood, DeviantArt, um, you know, back on uh, on some of those forums and on those websites, there were these spaces where it was easier to have a quiet side room, you know, where you could work a little more obscurely on something um, and have a little more space to kind of tool around with it. And I think that those are spaces that are important to defend and to make for yourself. Um, uh, it's like I think it's also super important to engage with social media to put your work out there on the regular to like be present to that um, especially as a freelancer like that's invaluable you know like if, if you want to be generating just like a, a general consistent awareness of like hey I exist I exist <laughs> um, hire me uh, it's important to keep a consistent sort of stream of stuff going out but in terms of those personal projects Jellybot's like Jellybots has been a many years long project um, that has taken a, a sort of funny route, and I won't go into the huge version of that story. But um, it, uh, yeah, it, it's hard to to find those spaces and to make art and story half in the mirror which is what feels like online when you're posting stuff regularly. And it's like, uh, it's like you're eating in a booth where the mirror of you eating is like directly in front of you. And so you're not just eating and enjoying your meal. Now you're wondering how you look while you do it. <laughs> um, and I think sort of the consistent presence of social media can be a little bit like this constant, like you look weird. Uh, you know, like, are you sketching right? Like, are your process pieces, like, as good as they could be? Um, so it's not just that you get to grow and iterate and practice, but now you have to look good doing it, too. Um, so, again, I would just say, like, like pulling some, some time aside, making a space to have something that's just your own, to sort of, like, just, just marinate that thing before you put it out there. Um, and I've learned that sort of both ways over. And I think the Patreon is a really interesting thing that way, because the way I'm experiencing it so far is that it is a little bit more of a quiet space. So you've taken the, like, 
internet and now you've whittled it down to people willing to support your work um, and now you can sort of talk to share with and develop for that smaller unit of people um, I just recently opened up a discord for the patrons on Patreon so now there's like a chat forum where people can kind of engage with each other and we're meeting each other and are getting to know each other um, and uh, yeah and that's been great like I think Patreon is an incredible tool like an incredible game changing thing and the fact that like I can make like a, a substantive chunk of my living wage off of just working on my dreams <laughs> it's like that's nuts. That's completely nuts. I keep waiting for the bomb to fall out on that. It's a hard thing to defend that time and to make that time. But now that I have some money coming in and some revenue, it adds an accountability layer, right? It's like, well, now I got to. Now I have to write this. Now I have to draw this. Now I have to be developing this. Um, because, you know, there's some some end goal <laughs> every month of like, you know, where's the art, man? Um, so... So that's, yeah, I think Patreon's an incredible thing. I think that it still is not, uh, it doesn't replace the hard work. It doesn't, like, eclipse the fact that you just need to, like, make the time to go away and, and make art. Um, it might not immediately get all the likes, you know, that might not get you that quick hit of, like, <laughs> feedback. Um, None. And that's tough. <laughs> I, I'm gonna be honest. Like that's just I. I much prefer that quick, speedy. Here's our okay. You like it? All right. Cool. <laughs> cool. We're going. We're going. You know, instead of this like long marathon running kind of mentality of like maybe there'll be a crowd at the end where the ribbon is. Maybe. <laughs> you know. But right now I'm sweating. My body's eating itself and my feet are bleeding inside my sneakers. Mm. Like, <laughs> so personal projects could be tough. And uh, honestly, I mean, Regan knows way more about this than I do. So if you are looking for advice about things like, like jelly butts, uh, you should probably talk to him. <laughs> we'll definitely keep that in mind. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Goodness, this one else. Okay, sure. Are, are we muted? Or are we no, we're not muted. Oh, nope, you're good. Okay, I can hear you. Oh, yeah. I can hear everything. Oh, God. There we go. I, so you produce a lot of artwork, and you're quite prolific. Um, when you're feeling burnt out from art, what are some things that uh, get you motivated on it again? And that kind of goes into uh, what you were talking about with your work with Jellybots, having that accountability um, on top of all the other projects that you're doing? How do you keep yourself creatively fresh? Mm, great question. Cool. Um, uh, so a couple of answers on that. So uh, uh, you are what you eat, right? So uh, like you literally are, right? Like you eat asparagus, asparagus goes through your body, it becomes like your fingernails and hair, and you get rid of the stuff you don't need. <laughs> So with art, you know, it's like it's it's made of the things that you're taking in, right? And you've already had, you know, 20 something years of time to sort of ingest. Um and you've been consistently putting it out there. Um but eventually that that like whole childhood catches up to you and you start to sort of realize you're you don't have a lot to go on anymore. So your tank is emptying out and you're like, man, I have like redrawn the things of my childhood so many times now and, and pulled on those dreams and memories. Um, what I usually say and, and what I really do think I, I believe in pretty hard is what I would call like the Kiki method. Uh, you guys know Kiki's delivery service? Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, so that's like, I love I, so Miyazaki Ghibli just great. I'm surrounded you can't see there's a Porco Rosa poster and a Windrise poster flanking you on either side right now um, just yeah but Kiki's delivery service I think speaks spoke to me like I love that movie as a kid when I couldn't admit it to my bro friends I was like I just like this movie about a little witch girl uh, and kept it real quiet <laughs> um and then eventually came back to it about the year after I graduated college or right when I was on the precipice of that. And like, 
I feel like I remember just like bawling. <laughs> like I was just like, oh, her powers are gone. Like I I felt that so hard. And the story for those of you who might not know, um, there's this main character Kiki's this little witch who. Um, over the course of the story, she encounters some of the realities of sort of stepping out on her own and being her own, uh, sort of starting a business and starting to work. And uh, through encountering some of the sort of negativity and the blowback and some of the stuff that, that life throws at you, um, she's unable to fly anymore. Like she loses her ability to get off the ground. Um, and she has this, there's this friend, uh, Ursula, who lives in the woods, uh, who's a painter of all things. So she's just kind of living off in the woods painting and Kiki's kind of has a moment where she's talking finally about how she just, her magic just came intuitively and now it's gone. Like, what do you do? Uh, and Ursula says something about like, it sounds like it's exactly like painting. Um, like, it's just like, so like Miyazaki is just taking it and being like, it's a metaphor for what I do. Um, and she says, like, you know, when I when I get when I run out of ideas, like I unplug, like I I, I take a walk, like I go off, I stop trying to like work on that that knot, and I take a break. You know, there's a time to like press in and push through it, and then there's a time to say like I just need to like reconnect with people I love, like I need to like step back and go for a walk, like under some trees <laughs> like i just need to like stare at like grass for like uh, just a while um go to a museum like just enjoy the fact that like not everything you do is art not everything you are is art and not everything that life has to offer you is like just draw, 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 draw. like there's there's a whole world and a whole like full person to be uh eat well and and get deep sleep um as best you can and, and take care of yourself like really truly do that because no company in the world and no project in the world is gonna suggest to you that you chill out no no the bigger the corporation and the the more glamorous the gig the more they're gonna they're gonna be you know pumped for you to, to do unpaid overtime um so it's kind of on you to defend those moments of like, man, I, I spent, like I'm burnt out and I burn out. Like I definitely burn out, um, to keep it fresh. Um, you know, in terms of that's like the stepping away stuff. That's like the one piece and the pressing in piece for me is usually about finding an angle that I didn't, I haven't attacked yet. Um, usually it's about switching mediums when I'm like burnt out on digital art and concept stuff. Um, I'll switch to watercolor. I'll just pull out a ballpoint pen, get some really crappy paper, and just start watercoloring. Like low bar for success. Like don't don't reach for like oil paints that are like thirty bucks a tube. And like you know, unless that's really like you you're confident that's gonna like bring life. Like I would just advise like switch it up, get some charcoal, you know, and some newsprint, and just go to town. Just go nuts. Go to life drawing, you know, like things that are like a little bit brainless and you're just reacting to life. Uh, go out and watercolor from life. Sculpt. Oh my gosh. Like, just pull out some, get some Play Doh. Get some Play Doh. It is so <laughs> relaxing and like therapeutic and it smells nice. And you can mix colors. There's, they always tell you not to mix the colors, but they mix beautifully like paint. You just roll, roll, and roll, 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 roll in purple. Um, and it's, it's awesome. So, I, I you know, finding a, a new tack. You know, to sort of shift the lens, um, and then I come back refreshed to my digital work, and I come back refreshed to whatever it is professionally I'm gonna do. Last thing, aquariums, zoos, zoos, yeah. aquariums. That's it. That's like my number one kiki moment of like, I feel so burned out. I can't do this anymore. I'm just gonna go, and then it's just fish. Like it's just me and some fish, and that's like all I need. Like, some people go to the ocean, some people go to the woods, some people want to go up a mountain, like, right on. If that's you, go up a mountain. I will go to the fish. I will stand next to a fish and cry quietly into my sketchbook <laughs> and begin to feel rejuvenated. If you're a concept artist and you're trying to design dragons, go look at a lizard for crying out. Like, I just saw a real live, in the zoo, on the ground, scaly, ah, like, just stare at it because that experience like I it, if you don't all you're going to draw is, is dragons that look like other people's drawings of dragons um, 
if you don't get out there and you don't feed yourself new food, if you're not putting new stuff in the tank, you're just going to be drawing spaceships that look like spaceships that look like the drawings of spaceships that somebody from Square Enix did of drawings of spaceships that somebody previously from Square Enix did. Like, it'll just sort of twist and become something un untethered from like the, the good things that drew you into what you did to begin with. You know, that, that fresh moment when you were a kid when you saw like i don't know whatever it is for you and you were like oh my gosh that's it you know like that that's what i want to do for me that was like lord of the rings i watched people doing doing that but like those guys stared at a lot of trees hmm. <laughs> like they just definitely tolkien himself would just he would write and then he would go smoke a pipe and look at trees like those were the things he would do um and that tree looking time don't underestimate the power of that to like fuel the creative process. Sorry, I'm done. End monologue. <laughs> Huge monologue. No, that's really awesome. I totally understand that. And um, I've had some experience of doing that myself. Sometimes you just need to pull away to really just get back into it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, next thing I wanted to ask is on your website, your personal website, it says, What matters most to me is the heart of the project. As a concept artist and illustrator, um, that is part of your job. Have you ever had a moment where you had a hard time connecting with the assignment you were given? And if so, what were some things you did to really understand the heart of the project and expand your work? Mm, all right, yeah. Um, you found me where I live, man. That's, that's it. Um, dang, that's, that is the struggle. Like, that... That's kind of why I freelance. Like I, I found that it was difficult. If I, yeah, you just you increase your chances of connecting emotionally and spiritually with the work you're doing um, by keeping the variety going. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, often again, it's like switching it up, trying to find a new angle. I always am digging for like, why do I care about this? Sometimes it's a lot about the conversations you're having with your client. So I'll come to a, honestly, at these, at these days, like high sci-fi fantasy stuff that is sort of a traditional video game staple is really bone dry to me. Like Shardbound at times was a hard project to get through because they're just like, some of the people who are writing it or making it are just like, and it's a wizard. And you're like, oh, like, I've done that. Like, like I, I've spent all my wizard points on old wizard. Like, I've, you know, I still love wizards. But you, you know what I mean? Like, it's a, mostly it's like a, it's a Viking berserker. And you're like, oh, man, how am I going to get into Viking berserker today? Because I just couldn't care less about a Viking Berserker right now. <laughs> um, and and that's the job. Like, you have to deliver at a high level. Um, so, a couple ways of doing that. The main first way I do is, is that I dig. So I talk to the people who are assigning this to me, and I try and find that heart. Um, and usually that's about asking the right questions. Uh, and that's a big big part of the job of a concept artist people don't really talk about, is learning. You have to understand the problem before you can solve it. Um, and so the one method, without understanding it, is going to have you drawing and 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 drawing until someone else decides that you're done. Um, which, generally speaking, is kind of what you do anyways. But you'll put 30 options up on the wall, and they'll be like, well, there's not a lot. I don't know. And you're like, I drew 30 things for you. <laughs> like, pick a thing. Um, they'll be like, I don't know, maybe like this one with this one and the head of that one. You're like, okay, cool. Can we get like maybe 20 more? And you're like, ah! And you draw, 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 draw. And you come back with 20 more in sort of a constellation of options like that. Um, and they're like, I don't know. I don't know. Reduce, reduce that process, but help the, help your clients come with you to that. This is kind of a little bit more like as a student, just do what you're told. Uh, as a first year, like I was cocky AF. I came into my first job like I know all about ideas, and I'm gonna tell you mine. And they were like, "You're a baby. Shut up." Um, it was a good thing. It was a good thing. Um, but eventually, learning about the process. So for instance, uh, there's a project I'm working on, I won't name, 
Um, but there were a couple of monsters, creature designs, right? And all they do, usually in a video game, all they do is punch or shoot or cast a spell, right? Like the, the creature-y, monster-y things. In terms of function, not very inspiring, you know? Once you've done that a few times, you're like, I am pumped to draw somebody throwing a rock. All right, now I've done it again. All right, now it's a spear. Now it's, uh, I don't know, I don't know, guys. Yeah, we're coming up with nothing here. Um, a boomerang. Uh, you know, you're just trying to find something fresh to add to that. Uh, the way I did it with this project, they gave me, like, three guys. There was, like, a, a sniper and a bomber and a shooter uh, kind of characters, monsters. Um and I realized I wasn't getting what I needed to get into this and to deliver what they needed. I could go away and draw them 30 things or kind of, I don't know, well, what do you think? But that would stretch this out forever, um, cost more money, take more time. Uh, so what I did was I asked them, I was like, okay, this is a 90s sitcom. These are all roommates. Who's what roommate? Hmm. Like, which monster? Like, tell me about the, the, the archetypes, right? And he's like, oh, okay. So the the shooter is like he's like the he like he's always putting weird stuff in the fridge like he always like drinks everybody else's milk you know and like doesn't put it back with the cap on and then like this guy he's like kind of sociopath he's like all in his head he's very cerebral he can't really like emotionally relate but he's like kind of off and like and that unlocked this whole level of the conversation um, where suddenly I was like oh boom and I hit him in like three drawings. Um, and that was huge. That was such a cool moment. <laughs> because so often you just spin your wheels forever. Um, I had like an emotional connection now to go with and be like, oh, I see how this relates to the story. And there are people on projects who are able to help you sort of uncover what it is that gets them excited about it. And if you can catch the contagious energy about what, what they're pumped about and funnel that into your own work and try and interpret that, you know, um, because it's locked in their heads usually. There's something locked in there when they say, like, yeah, she's the hero. And you're like, cool. So is she fun? They're like, well, she's the hero. And you're like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, what on earth? Like a Luke Skywalker, but, a, you know, like, she's like, you know, you got to give me more. You've just, you got to. And so the digging and the finding the right kind of way to ask and sort of, it's like throwing pebbles at it until it falls loose. Um, so that's a big one for, for <laughs> finding the heart. Does that make sense? Makes yeah. total sense. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that's, that's such a funny way to get like an idea out of somebody to turn a game yeah. about monsters throwing rocks into college roommates and then it just unlocks every idea possible. It was nuts. I can't believe it worked, but it was good. Yeah. Good moment. Oh man, awesome. All right. <clears throat> All right. So uh, we have another question. Um, as students in art school, sometimes we tend to have blinders on when it comes to what we think we know about our classes, um, like the work we're producing or what the industry wants us to see uh, what our work looks like. However, we really have very limited, limited experience with that. Um, and we have a question. If you could go back to art school, what are some things that you would do differently? Um, what would you try to focus on? And hopefully this will uh, help us gain a little more uh, perspective on our art school career and be more prepared to enter the workforce. And tell a thing or two to our art school teachers. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know everything about ideas. Uh, <laughs> I did that, for sure. Can I, let me ask you about that, though. So. There were two parts to that question, right? There's sort of uh, advice for what to work on and then sort of a piece about the limited understanding you might have of an industry. Is that correct? Like, what's tell, tell me about that second part. Uh, yeah, so um, we, as students, we don't really have much experience for what we think the industry wants to see or what we think are uh, professors, the certain type of art that we create. Um, there's kind of like a notion of uh, we have to be doing these things, but we don't really know that because we don't have that much experience in what they actually want to see, what they actually want us to be working on, the types of things that 
uh, working professionals, employers, want us to do. So if you could talk a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. It's clarifying. Um, yeah, okay. So let me just see a show of hands with you guys. So who's who's really pumped about video games? Who wants to do video game concept art? Okay, how about animation? Yeah, a little so on Regan. Animation stuff? Okay, <laughs> so maybe like 60-40 games to animation, something like that. Um, every industry is different in terms of what they want and what they're looking for. So there's a big thing there. Schools are super interested in your tuition money, and so what that portfolio uh, process is a different one because they they want your money and now you want their money. Um, so the dynamic is subtly different. Initially, that first school portfolio thing, they're looking at raw talent and, and sort of um, potential, right? Um, it would be a mistake to think entirely the same way about applying for jobs with a portfolio. Um, that process is no longer about them looking necessarily. They will. There will be people who will look at your portfolio and see your potential. But they're also just about to hand you some money and, and give you a piece of their baby, like the thing that they are working on that they care a lot about. Um, and they have high standards, justifiably. Um, also, they're scared that they're not going to make that money back. Uh, when they go to market, stuff like that. So taking a chance on you is a harder thing to do um, than a school. So um, a lot of it's really simple. Like it, I think that uh, students, we try to sort of guess around like, oh, you know, figure drawing and this and that, and should I add this? Should I, should I show more variety? Should I focus more tightly or whatever? Um, everything's, it's all good if it's good. So one thing for sure, only put the pieces you believe in in your portfolio. If, if it's something that you're adding that you're thinking you just kind of need to add because a portfolio has these things, but you don't feel confident about it, don't put it in there. Um, uh, never in an interview uh, uh, walk your work back. Never apologize for what you're showing somebody. I had a harrowing portfolio review with a uh, an agent that my art director had sent me up with shortly after college, a couple years after. And I went in with my portfolio, live interview, handed this guy the portfolio. He's like, oh, all right. Just flipping. It's kind of a silent interview. Silent interviews are not bad. Like, or silent portfolio reviews are not bad. Sometimes a silent portfolio review means, oh, holy shit, this is good stuff. Like, there's a, an odd silence, and then there's a bad silence. But don't feel like you need to fill either one of those with a profusion of words. <laughs> don't, um, I was nervous because it was quiet, and he was taking his time. And he hit a page where there was some older stuff. There was some student at work, and I stopped him and was like, oh, just so you know, that's, that's older, that's student work. That's not representative of what, what I'm doing right now. He closed the portfolio, whole thing, slid it across the table, and he was like, then why are you showing it to me? And that was it. That was the end of that portfolio review. Um, if you have 8.5 by 11 prints, put it in an 8.5 by 11 portfolio. If you have student work in your portfolio that's not your strongest, take it out, and certainly don't apologize for it if it's in there. Um, that's just like portfolio review advice but uh, in terms of like what studios expect they want to see that you can do what they do um, that's like the simplest simplest thing you know they want to see variety sometimes they want to see what you do uniquely that could lead them in a new direction um, so it's good to have both but the, the, the ground level basic is if I'm Blizzard and I'm looking at your portfolio, I want to see that you can do what Blizzard does in the style that Blizzard does it. Um, I don't want to see, you know, your incredible, not necessarily, but I, I don't want to only see your incredible My Little Pony fan art. Like, if it's sick and you have, like, hella giant swords and, like, you can show me that you know what a bicep looks like, and then you hit me with your brony stuff, maybe we're good. You know, maybe maybe we're having a conversation about, like, you know, we do have some cute characters in this game and I don't really know what to do with them. You know, these gnomes, we just keep adding wrinkles and I don't know why nobody likes them very much. Um, and, uh... 
Uh, but I think, again, just the, the base level, like, hey, you know, I get it. I can do this technically at a high level, and I can do it in a look like what you're you're producing. Uh, just look at portfolios of people who are already working there and do your best to kind of bring your stuff up in the style and level of that. Um, if variety is going to make you look good, <laughs> do it. If it's going to add weak pieces to your portfolio, don't. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, for, for, for me, my career has been so weird that like the super focused thing, again, I would say out of school, you want to focus, you want to pick a bread, pick a bread, that's your bread. You want multigrain, you're going multigrain. It's not the last bread you're ever going to eat. It's just the first bread, right? So get your English muffins. This is what I'm doing. Focus your portfolio. I'm the English muffin guy today. This is what's happening. Here's some raisins just to see. Maybe you like that. And we're good. Um, add a little cinnamon, you know, just a little bit of something else, a little spice, but like ground me and pick a direction. Um, uh, and then diversify from there, you know, like find directions that you believe in and build slowly. Uh, I think we get too uh, obsessed with going big too fast, uh, just getting everything too quickly. And that was the mistake of a company like 38 Studios that started out out of nowhere and they were like, that's it, we're making World of Warcraft. That's it, we're just doing it. We're taking over the MMO space. And you gotta make Warcraft one, and then two, mm. and then three, over a decade or two. And then, you know what I mean? So start somewhere and be confident about where you start. Yeah, that's great. I've definitely seen some examples of what you said. Like, um, I don't know how much you know about uh, Overwatch and its history, but it was originally supposed to be Titan and the whole Titan team was supposed to be like this big team of rock stars and that eventually <laughs> fell apart before Overwatch came about. So <laughs> there are like various examples of that all throughout the industry of like people starting huge and then like collapsing. And going off of that, yeah. would you say that coming from college, let's say if you want to work on video games um, or, or like for an example, video games, would you recommend people to shoot more towards like indie video games or would you like recommend like try to go for AAA or try to go like would you going off of what you just said would you recommend starting small in that sense as well I would yeah for sure um has anybody seen the movie Waterworld yeah. anybody except for Reagan <laughs> <laughs> nice and that guy way to go with that guy you're my boy um okay Waterworld is a movie, it's not that great, but it's kind of wonderful. It's it's a bit of both. Um, but in it, uh, oh my gosh, Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner, <laughs> so the world is drowned, right? It's all water. He lives on a catamaran, like a single sailboat, and he has rigged this single catamaran uh, with all these systems that he knows how to do. He has grown gills to adapt to his like world of, of water, right? And he's living on his boat, and that boat has this system of like, the, the sun is growing this little vegetable garden, the vegetable garden, he eats it, he pees, he pees into jars, he recycles the water through a filtering system, it waters the vegetable garden, and he's completely self-sustaining, right? Like, he has a closed system, and that's how he survives the chaos of this world. Water world. It's great. Um, the Kevin Costner. Uh, recycle your pee and drink it. Um, that's my advice about keeping it small. Like, keep it tight. Keep it something that you know how to get into your head. The world is something you cannot control. The huge studios coming and going, big opportunities here and there, you can't control that. But you can control this. So whatever it is you're doing work-wise and whatever your ambitions are set on, like, if you want to build, you know, towards a big major goal, start tight. That would be my advice. Like, start close, something you know you can sort of do and build iteratively on. So yes, I would say like indie studios, contracts that are like stuff where you can be using as like a workout regularly and building your strength, building your skills slowly, building that system. You know, maybe you're really good with characters, but you're weak on environments and you get a smaller gig that is more character oriented, but has an opportunity to get some environment work going, do that and like slowly build those skills and then get that portfolio together. But at least you're still moving, you know, um, at least you're still going. And I think that's key. Um, so just find a, find something that you, 
can use to get you to the next spot um, that you can really commit to, you know, commit to that effort to. I think Indie Game Studios, I was talking to a friend. Do you guys know Hob, this game that just launched? Hob? Um, H O B. <laughs> it's great. You should look it up. Um, the guys who did uh, crap. Another game that was good <laughs> uh, made a game called Hop, uh, and uh, it's great. I got to do a little poster for it. Um, it's kind of a Zelda esque kind of indie sort of exploring puzzle solver with a uh, little character with like a red hood that looks a little bit like the guy from Journey. Yeah. Um, but with a giant Hellboy fist. Um, this little project is doing so well for them. They've banded together. They're a small indie studio. I was talking to my friend who I used to work with who's working there now. And he was bummed that he wasn't working at Blizzard. And I just couldn't understand. Because to me, you work for Blizzard and you definitely will be making orcs. Like, and swords and orc swords. And sword orcs. And orcs with swords and orcs that look like swords and swords that look like orcs and orcs covered in swords and bushes that look like swords that the orcs have to sort of tie the whole art style together. Like, you know your path, right? You know exactly what you're doing. The future is laid out. Like, that is, you're locked in. Um, and uh, with an indie studio, you just don't know what it's going to be. You could be at the beginning of the first ever World of Warcraft or, you know, Warcraft title and not know it. But that's how these things start, right? Like, Nintendo starts with somebody being like, I don't know, tubes? Maybe a plumber? I don't know, mushrooms? Like, uh, you you build from that ground up and you have the opportunity to get in on, as a powerful creative influence on something that's new, as opposed to a minimal creative influence on something that's already successful. Um, so I would say that there's a romance to like AAA that I think it hasn't necessarily uh, followed through on in my experience. I think the romance to me is, is in the smaller studios and those indie opportunities. All right, that's awesome advice. Thanks. Um, and going off of that, one thing that a lot of students do, in fact, a lot of um, previous year students were um, already doing this, but one big thing artists tend to think is all the jobs are in LA, all the jobs are on the West Coast, everyone needs to go there if you need to make work in the entertainment industry. What what are you what are your thoughts on that? And would you recommend doing it or a specific time to do it within your artistic career? Hmm. Um Wow, yeah, good question. So I've I've held out in Providence, Rhode Island for like eight years. Um and all the client work that I've done um, working for um, Hasbro, Mattel, EA, Disney. Um, I did some work with Riot. Uh, I'm doing some work with companies associated with Nintendo that I can talk about. So, like all of these <laughs> things, I've I've been able to do as a freelancer based in Providence, Rhode Island, which is like podunk nowhere, um, more or less. Um, <laughs> So I would say it's open. Like, it's totally a viable thing. The internet makes that possible. If this were 1995 and snail mail were the only way to meaningfully get art to somebody at a high resolution and otherwise, like, you're faxing stuff and, you know, then you got to move to New York, you got to move to L.A., you got to be around people where you can, like, walk to their door and hand them the thing. Um, that is not the case anymore. However, in terms of full-time jobs, that's absolutely true. Like... Full time with benefits, in house, in office pay. West Coast is your best bet. There are enclaves all over the place. There's like Austin, there's Nashville, um, there's like Canada, there's Vancouver and Toronto, there's even stuff going on in Montreal. There's, um, I, I, there's places I know I'm not thinking of, but there are enclaves in different spots, you know, where there are clusters of studios. The tax situation is good for studio growth. Things just happen to have taken shape. Seattle, I would love to work in Seattle. It's great up there for, for game development. Um, and those are places where, like, there's a high density of nerds per capita, right? And that's just, that's a good feeling. Like, you go and they have, like, bars that serve blue milk and like rancor heads on the wall and you can go to the, like there are drink and draws like in the city and there's just like because there's just too many nerds and they need to hang out um they're in providence rhode island like 
I am I'm the Lorax of nerds. Like I'm the last one. <laughs> like, I'm like, remember the nerds. Like uh, and it's a it's a it's kind of great to go out to places like LA or whatever and have that hit of like, oh my gosh, like there's a, a culture for art school dorks here. Um, that's so there's there's some fun there to be had. And then there's some fun to be like, you know what? Like that I don't need to bow to that culture. I don't need to be a part of you know, I don't need to move my whole life and my whole everything just to to pursue this. But that's a personal decision, you know. That's like something that you have to reach on your own. Um, and if you're willing to do it, it's great. And all those conferences and the serendipitous like in a coffee shop with a sketchbook running in to the director of something something like that can happen over there with a, a greater degree of frequency. Um, so it's definitely got its benefits for sure. And this little like weird. I don't know what I would call this, like, yeah, Lorax lifestyle out here. I don't feel like that's accurate to the spirit of the story of a Lorax, but whatever. Um, so being the only one, uh, the Tigger. Um, uh, yeah, it's just, it's tough. It's kind of got its own sort of perks, though. It's kind of a nice thing to live among, like, normal people and have a perspective that's not just, like, Cartoons are everything. Like, there's a healthy quality to that, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Um. So we have a little bit of a fun question here. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> on your behalf, it says that you've done some voice acting. Oh. <laughs> Can you tell us what you've done? <laughs> I don't, I, oh man, now I have two voices, right? This is the part where I do voices. Bill Bear Baggins, I'm not trying to rob you. I'm trying to help you. Um, yeah, yeah, I do voices. I love, like, I, <laughs> I was raised overseas, um, I was raised, actually, I was raised in Austria, where I uh, grew up among a lot of Germans and Austrians, and uh, spoke uh, a little bit of, of Deutsch, um, a, petit peu, a little bit of uh, French as well. Uh, you live uh, in France for a couple of years, and you pick up the accent pretty easy. Uh, they do some crazy things when they kind of stretch their voice, but... Uh, uh, I love Irish. Like Ireland's my favorite. You know, I love to. I'd love to just live there forever. And frankly, you know, my my fiance, she likes she likes uh, this sort of uh, Scottish. The Scottish one is a bit husky, like Gerard Butler. Uh, I just grew up traveling a lot and around a lot of different voices. Um, and I just I'm a parrot, you know. Uh, and so when I'm around a, a video game project. Uh, Rare these days because I'm not in a studio with people and I don't have like access to like high degree of sound equipment. Um, but I just did a bunch of uh, auditions actually for a friend who's making a an indie game, and they needed a frog who was also a, a corporal or something like that in like a mech suit. It was great. I was just like, I don't even, you know. <laughs> I'm trying to summon to mind what one of my frog general voices were. I think I played kind of a droopy dog, kind of, you know, soldier, what are you doing? Like, I uh, kind of wanted that wide, wide mouth kind of, you know, get like, that kind of thing. Um, let's try that out a little bit. I think they wanted sort of a sort of a higher kind of Nigel Thornberry British, like, oh no, get out of there. Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's probably coming out real loud. It's already loud on my end, so I apologize. I'm screaming into a microphone the second I inch away. Um, so I've done I'm mostly uh, the only work I've done a voice or two for Shardbound. Um, I can't remember which characters they are. I got in the booth while I was there. Um, pretty pretty generic stuff like wow, oh no, ow, 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 ow. <laughs> like that kind of stuff you just do a lot of that that's mostly video games you're like <laughs> like that's the majority of what you get into a booth and you pretend to be hit by a variety of different things from different angles that's the most of it you know so. can you imagine people coming in that's really amazing <laughs> 
can we can only imagine people in the hall coming like walking by. You can elaborate now. And they can hear what's going on in here. <laughs> well, th- thank you for blessing them with your awesome voice acting talents. Yeah, <laughs> yeah everyone else. Yeah, there it is. It's good. Uh, one question I thought of, though, kind of spur of the moment, was one thing they definitely do not teach as well, as much in typical art schools is the business of art, and especially like when it comes to trying to find jobs and freelancing. That's something that I see to be very, very, very underplayed when it comes to teachers, and it's a very Big important time. thing because it's literally you getting a job. So yes. would you give any tips and pointers on like trying to be an artist and a businessman for an artist because that is really diff- difficult to do. Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I have come up against uh, the question with comics and kids' book stuff. So the Disney tax, like I did the Curse of Maleficent, I did Pete's Dragon, I'm doing Jelly Bots, talking to a lot of people about book stuff, um, of whether I get an agent or not. Because um, that's a big common practice. Not in video games, not in animation so much, but for other things like that, books book people have agents for whatever reason um i have not encountered a situation in which i feel like an agent would be an asset to me yet uh there are situations for sure again reagan might be another person to talk to about he knows other people in, in books and publishing um there you go just just a switch um i i being your own uh, boss in that way, or sort of, it's a, it's a pain in the butt. It's the last skills you got to learn really quick, and they really don't play it up at art school, and it sucks. Um, invoicing people on the regular, knowing what to put in invoice, um, reading over your contracts, and making sure you know what clauses mean what, what's in there, um, is key. Uh, taxes, understanding what you're in for there. Okay, really quick, freelance tax. So if you work for a studio in-house, right? They are going to be withholding taxes for you. When you sign up, part of all the papers is a paper where you mark one or two people in your household, yourself or somebody else, or zero, you're claiming. And then they go and quietly deal with all of that for you, with the government. Um, They're handling your taxes, and by the end of the year, you may have heard from other friends and neighbors that they get tax money back from the government when April rolls around. That's like maybe what you expect. You expect April to come, and you get money. If you are a freelancer, April is the time you lose money. (laughs) You will not be receiving money back. Um, You might lose less money but you will be handing over a a big check. Uh, Quarterly taxes are a thing that I'm just starting to figure out. Uh, I've been fined for it this year finally, and I need to figure it out. I cannot speak to that, but you need to be filing quarterly if you're a freelancer, that's a whole other thing. But just think, when you're freelancing, every contract comes in, one third of that money goes away. Just, it's not yours. One third of your money is the government's and that's just a company will be withholding that for you and separating that out and making that a lot easier and that's why you might get money back at the end because they might have taken too much out and if you look at your pay stubs it's going to be a line of how much you technically made how much they took away how much you got at the end Um, as a freelancer you're just getting how much you actually made total and they're like good luck do it yourself so it's on you to put aside one third of your income 30 percent right um and just have it squirreled away. What I've done, a little tip too for, for you guys, uh, I work, I bank through Bank of America. I think pretty much most other online banking services have an equivalent thing. You can open up a new account for free. So I have a checking account, I have a savings account, and I have a tax savings account. And a tax savings account is just a bucket where I can put it where I'm not going to pull from it at any other point during the year. So I can just put my 30% in my third tax savings account and just say, not mine, not mine, not mine. So anything that's in savings or checking, I can access, and that's okay. I can survive off of that. But this money was never going to be mine to begin with, and you just got to divorce yourself from the idea that you're going to get to keep it. Um, So that's a big, like, nobody told me that, and I was furious. Like, when it finally came down to it, I, I was so... Uh, angry at the universe, but it was just a fact that was always the case that nobody had, had thought to inform me of. Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, as a freelancer, you get to set your own rate. Um, you get to negotiate your own prices. 
I think that's a great thing. Um, but uh, all the rules about you know all the things that apply to like people in studios, seniority, and going rates and stuff like that. Like there's a there's a cost. So I would say take a look at a yearly salary you think might be good and then sort of talk to people in whatever industry you're, you're moving towards and think about an entry level yearly salary divide that up into the hours what an hourly rate would be to make that yearly salary over a year working five days a week eight hours a day and add a little bit add like a couple bucks an hour maybe five whatever it is you feel comfortable with um, to that because now you're paying for your own health care now you're taking on this new tax burden now you're so you're padding it out a little bit because you're assuming a lot more of the risk you're not going to be working constantly you know you're going to be working really hard for two weeks kind of not hard for a week really hard for you know half a week and then pick up a couple you know like it'll be pieces that you'll find uh sort of come together in different arrangements along the way um so sort of padding the rate just a little bit from the that yearly amount helps <laughs> get you from i have so much work i can't I, I can't even stand it and then like i have no work at all it gets you through that that period of time so that's another tidbit i would pass on is plan for moments when the feast is over uh charge accordingly set aside a third um talk to other people about their best practices financially uh keep an eye on what you're doing negotiate your rates read your contracts I, as a free, if you are headed into freelance, again, I don't know who is and what the situation will be, but in general, if you're heading into freelance, if you're headed for a AAA studio, probably ignore this part, uh, but freelancers, I do not sign non-competes. So some studios will try and hit you with uh, a clause in the contract that says uh, you are not allowed to work for any studio that's doing similar projects or work uh, to ours. Call it out in the contract, ask them to change it or delete it. When you get a contract, that's your opportunity to say, this and this, I don't like it. Can we change the language? Can we adjust this? Is there any give? You know, there's an opportunity for you to say, to, to, to push a little back when a contract comes through. Um, Non-competes are a big, big part of that. I've walked on a number of lucrative contracts, things like Lego. Uh, I did not work for Lego because they were not cool with me working for Play-Doh or for Mattel or whatever. And it's like, that's, those are clients. Like I gotta, I gotta eat and you are not committing to me Lego to like be my bread and butter for a long period of time consistently. So I'm not signing a non-compete that, that shackles me to a crappy situation. So don't, you know, be canny about stuff like that. Look for predatory con contract stuff. Uh, that puts their interest far above yours because it's there. Okay. Sorry, that's a bit of a doubt. No, it's no. good. That's awesome. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thank you. No worries. What like earlier alert system? Mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. What's that? Oh. There's like an early alert system. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, it's like, got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we just have uh, one more question before we move into a little bit of Q&A from these people. And um, that question is, uh, what are you looking forward to in the future regarding your personal artwork? What are you, yeah. You know, cool, exploring. yeah. Um, I am undergoing what I've talked to my friend. I, I work with my buddy John Lauren pretty consistently, collaboratively. Um, I'm, I'm trying to pull off what we were calling the whimsification. Um, so I, I've loved working on some of the more kind of fantasy AAA kind of stuff, but um, but really Wing Feather Saga, Jellybots, like these are things that are like, I'm, I'm in and they feel a lot closer to heart for me. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to increasingly pursuing that. I'm trying to shift my work away from video games and towards animation because I'm realizing that story is what compels me. Um, and that for video games, often story is a nice extra. Um, but the more, more often than not function and gameplay and the fun of function and gameplay take precedent. Um, so 
when that comes out of character design, you're designing characters that are like uh, they're really cool looking, and they're designed to communicate their function immediately. And I really am excited about moving away from just like trying to communicate. This person throws rocks. They throw rocks. They're a rock thrower. To uh, designing characters that have a little bit more um, versatility and nuance in sort of a way that they contribute to story. Um, and there's decisions you make about character design. Um, in terms of metaphor and what you're communicating and how you're designing them to fit a story and this, their story purpose. Um, that I just, uh, I love that stuff. And I could go on. That's a whole other, like, that's a lecture in and of itself. But, um, yeah, pumped about story, pumped about more, like, whimsy and animation-related work. Uh, I'm starting a contract with DreamWorks next week, which I'm really pumped about. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think hopefully things can continue to develop in that way. The other thing, you know, uh, Wing Feather Saga from premieres our pilot we're having a little premiere for our pilot in nashville in two weeks um that's coming in hot and heavy and we're gonna break the landing gear off it but hopefully we like <laughs> into the finish line um but i'm really excited about that team and that project and hopefully in a, a month or two probably around the holiday season that will show up online um so you guys get to see what we've been working on with that which has been fun and, and really close to my heart because it's just story and it's kids and it's adventure and it's dragons and it's just it's good stuff um, and Jellybots I mean just the ongoing development on Jellybots like the more I think about it the more I talk to people about it the more writing I'm doing I'm connecting with some people in animation and in publishing and talking about stuff there and it's going to be pretty cool so I'm really excited about where that's going um it's just cool to just be doing it, you know? Like, it's it's not a maybe anymore. It's just, like, a matter-of-time thing at this point, and that feels really cool. So, yeah. Great. Yeah, that's super cool. We're definitely going to be... I'll, I'll make sure it's my responsibility to just spread your work around whenever it releases. Just oh, thank you. Throw it all over the internet and all over these people. <laughs> but, <it's, laughs> but all right. <laughs> If uh, that's all of the questions we have, so I think it'd be cool to open up to Q and A. Yes. Do it. All right. So I'm just gonna adjust the mic, and anyone who wants to come and talk, just come up here and ask a question. If there are any. Oh, welcome. All right. All right. Hey. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, introduction. Introduction. I, do you got it, or is it my phone? You might want to move the camera. <laughs> Yeah, so Martin has no face. I have no head. It's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. You can just talk to me. All right. Well, I. <laughs> can you just shut <laughs> it up right here? That's All fine. Right. Okay. Cool. Well, okay. I was just curious as someone who I've seen your work from Photoshop and then going into Procreate. How is that transition for you? Because I remember when you posted about it, saying like, "I'm just switching to this now because it's so great." Like. What about a medium kind of attracts you like that, and how important do you think tools such as that are to art now and your work specifically? Mm. It's a great question. Um, Procreate. So this is my baby right here. <laughs> we love her. Um, this is Mobile Battle Station Tall Geese 2. Um, uh, oh, it's been so good. Uh, for me, my my... My tool shifts because of other reasons, right? The desire to go iPad Pro was because I needed to travel. The reason I needed to travel was because I was falling in love with this person who was across the country. <laughs> um, and I needed to get out, like, real quick. And you can't just, like, take your Cintiq and, like, get on a plane. <laughs> um, you kind of can't, but it's it's not sustainable. <laughs> um, so uh, switching to that was... was was huge and like I said earlier about changing mediums you know changing to, to watercolor or sculpting or whatever that new medium change helps unlock new things for your art style and the approach um, the, the, the way you approach your art um, some people are frustrated with things like the iPad or with Procreate because it doesn't have every capability that Photoshop does um, for me those were I, I just using it in the shop, I was like, oh, I can just, I can, I'll find a way to make this work. Because the immediate feel was like, no, this is good. 
And you guys know that. That's not for everybody. That's not the same for everybody at all. You know, you pick up, some people pick up gouache and they're like, oh, yes. You know, some people pick up charcoal. They're like, yeah, this is mine. <laughs> like you find your, it's like the, the wizard and the wand, like chooses the, the wand chooses the wizard, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you find your tool and it speaks to you in some, some level. And those limitations become assets. Uh, just like picking a bread, right? You're like winnowing it down. Now I maybe I can't do the exact same kind of line art I used to do because the tools not doesn't handle that quite as well, or for whatever reason, like there's just certain things that it's better at painting than it is at like sort of crisp inking. Mm-hmm. Um, so now I'm like, all right, well let's paint. <laughs> like so, I've adjusted my stuff to to sort of accommodate for that tool a little bit more, and for me, that's been like a really fun experience and a really cool way to like respond to a uh, new landscape, you know, by just saying like, all right, well, let's like change my art style just a little bit to adapt to this, uh, and I feel like I've grown a lot as a result of that uh, new change because you hit limits, right? You hit like a. Uh, uh, roadblocks along the way with with whatever tool you have um and for me again like the the mobility was just so worth it um and now i have all these weird coffee shop stories and like (laughs) moments that have happened like because i've been out and about and like some guy in like knee-high boots and like a tank top is like can you draw my like my workout lion logo (laughs) for my personal business and tattoo it's like (laughs) who are you (laughs) Um, i've been in a cafe where a woman had an hour three two two hour long therapy consulting session next to me with a woman who turned out to be like a psychic um, (laughs) in the coffee shop and then her husband showed up like 20 minutes later and was like where have you been just one earphone off nothing in my headphones Oh my gosh. Um, that could have never happened without the iPad. Yeah. So stuff like that, you know, like these unexpected little things become possible when you are willing to accept like that there are changes that are just inherently part of the process. So I don't know if that, does that answer your question or? Yeah, it's good. It's on my, okay. Oh yeah, it's good. Okay. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Um, I've got a question. Come up here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You can just you can shout it, or you can oh, come up. Can you hear me? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So working in like industry and like video games and animation, I know when I'm working, I'm like most inspired and I have the most ideas to pull from when I'm like playing video games or reading or just like consuming the content that I want to make. Um. Mm. Do you still find time to like? do that when you're so busy like freelancing and doing these other projects that overlap in a similar way i guess Mm, yeah that's a tricky one yeah uh yes but so i don't watch a lot of things anymore i listen to them um (laughs) usually i I always like right now i am like halfway through voltron um (laughs) But I've seen maybe like 10% of Voltron um, because my eyes are on the work that I'm doing while that's playing in the background. Um, I do a lot of audiobooks. I do a lot of podcasts. Um, my fiance and I, like, she's, she's big into video games. And so we played Breath of the Wild together. And that was, like, freaking amazing. And, like, sometimes those phases will, like, sweep in. Like, Zelda came in and it was, like... Oh man, like my contract work is gonna take a bit of a hit because that, that was just that was what I was doing. Um, oh my gosh, the summer of Pokemon Go, like I was freaking gone. I was Pokemon gone. Like I was out. Uh, I was like out in strange like parks in cities that I had no business being in, being strangers who were like, want to find a Gyarados? At like 2 in the morning. Like, it was nuts. I went insane. And I was just like, ah, people! People who are nerds out in the world. Um, so yeah, I find time to have fun and to do these things. And those are like those great little mental breaks that you can take too. You know? Um, if you can't get to the aquarium or whatever, you know. Um, if you can't be with the fish, then I guess play video games. Um, Stay inside. But yeah, no, I love I love doing that stuff and going to movies and Blade Runner uh, twenty forty nine is amazing. So what? I cried. Like, what? Um, so yeah, I, definitely, definitely 
it's tricky and it's you got to balance it out and just because you're making video games does not mean that when you're playing it it's work <laughs> so some of it loses its magic a little bit and that's just the truth i had i was um some somebody uh the gym was asking me about like what was it it was about um hasbro and they were like so what's it like working at hasbro and i was like do you like santa claus <laughs> and they're like, well, yeah, yeah. is that Christmas time? Like, yeah. It's like, well, would you like to be on the factory line of elves <laughs> making, like, 100 wooden trains? Like, maybe yeah. your love of Santa Claus is better appreciated yeah. from, like, a distance with some cookies. <laughs> like, it's not always the dream to, like, be right in the thick of it. Uh, and you see behind the curtain a little bit, and you're like, oh, all right. And there's tough stuff. There's tough stuff. And then sometimes there's people, you come to it with like this like wondrous, like, I sure just love worlds of video games. And they're like, it's a job, kid, get over it. You know, like, oh, it's super sexist and shitty. Like, and, and, and you just have to deal with like the man behind the curtain being like, not who you expected. Um, I have no way of preparing you for that. So just brace yourself. <laughs> there are a couple of moments. There are going to be moments where, like, with flight, it's like just as great as you thought it would be and the people rule and it's just like this is amazing these people are great they're doing something wonderful i don't know how this even exists like i'm i'm swimming i'm i'm flying this is just ah so good and then there'll be moments when it's like man i wish i'd never met my hero because <laughs> that guy is a jerk um yeah uh, second, I won't name it. kind of jumping off of that do you find like in this first few <clears throat> like interview processes did you know a lot about like um what was the first company you worked for 38 studios yeah did you know a lot about like their games and stuff like that and that like where you expected to know about that and stuff like that like i, I heard a lot of people like i have some friends who uh were interviewed for like blizzard internships and stuff like that and like they were expected yes. to have played the games and like known the characters and i beyond like here's what we like i know your mission statement like, did you ever encounter that and, like, have a blank, or just what's your experience? I think to balance that out, if you are really excited and trying to get a job and get an opportunity, you need to do your homework. Um, and so there's not a company really where I've gone in and been like, I know nothing about your, your work. If I'm interviewing, I've Googled it, I've watched videos, I'm, like, up on the product. Um, I think that's just basic homework you know it's like yes i do no no i don't i can't name heroes from league of legends off the top of my my head like no i have not logged hours i am not ranked nor will i be ever like i just have no that's not my jam but i will draw the crap out of some dudes with giant swords for you <laughs> um i think those two things are not the same you know what i mean like they're just not and i think it's important M my 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 rebelliousness there comes from this fact. In the games industry in particular, uh, you guys probably heard about the phenomenon of crunch, crunch time. Um, it is where they hire you on full time and they pay you a consistent salary and then work you for overtime indefinitely um, because games are important and they didn't plan well. Uh, and it's a norm in a lot of AAA game studios where they just like, oh yeah, no, we're all staying. We've got sleeping bags and snacks you know like it's time to go and you're like i have a wife and child like i have i have family like i have lupus like you just there's like all kinds of my life is going on entirely separate from i don't have lupus or a wife and child um entirely separately from what is happening here and this is a job it's an amazing job and it's a great opportunity but part of why companies hire fans is because fans do crunch and they don't ask questions and I, I think that's a little shady. Um, so I think, uh, I think your enthusiasm is yours, and it's a precious thing that you have, and guard that. You know, if you're pumped about something, um, respect yourself when the opportunity comes along, and they're like, "Do you want to work for us? Do you want to work for us all the time?" And you're like, oh. "You kind of do, and you would, because now you're in the position." that like Mickey Mouse is like oh, oh, oh. I'm sure you don't mind paid overtime and you're like oh Mickey piss off <laughs> like um, you have to at some point reach the point where your backbone can't bend anymore and you're like no uh, I can't do this and I'm a big fan of like 
you know, uh, moments when the artists will stand up for their like fundamental rights and their, their workers' rights and stuff like that. And I think that's really important. So, um, just because a company is big and glamorous doesn't mean that they get to, to make you do unreasonable things for no pay. Fight the power. Thanks. <laughs> 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 Rise of the artist. Anybody else? I have a question. Go for it, Jack. <clears throat> hey, what's up, man? Uh, what's up? Yo, so uh, often when I do commission work or do work for other people, I blank. Uh, I look at that sheet of paper and I find all of my skill dissipates into a default uninteresting piece because I'm afraid they won't like my style on things. But when I'm doing like personal work, it comes out much better because there's passion involved. So how do you deal with pressure slash expectations when money is on the table? Mm. Dude, that is that's great. That's a great question. That is like that's that's the, the job. Um, there's a lot of quotes that float around out there. Um, they're a little bit tough love on this one. Um, I, it's not really the angle I would go, but things like inspiration is for amateurs and stuff like that, or it's like inspiration comes and goes. Like inspiration is fickle, and those moments of personal work, that feeling of just like I'm going and it's great and nothing can stop me because I'm just drawing and I love to draw. Um, those those moments happen, and it's not like they don't, but that is not the the norm for the work that you'll be doing. And I think that the the work of practice and building skills and building a career is not necessarily so. Say this is your best day and this is your worst day, right? It's not about moving the best day, the best day will rise, you know, but the best is always great. It's about bringing your, your practice, your figure drawing, your constant sort of building. It's about bringing your worst day up to a point where they're close. There's less of a noticeable gap between those two things. And that just takes time. That's just time and practice. Um, uh, to that earlier question about digging for the heart of a project. That's where I, I thrive and I, I ask a lot of questions because what I want in those moments is to try and forget the money on the table, forget the pressure of the situation and lose myself in why are they excited about this? Why did, should this exist? What is the like underlying thing that's trying to like crawl out of this into the world? Um, and how can I plug into that? So I think asking the right questions and then just like, just honestly, the, 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 I wish there was an easier thing to say than it's just it's it's hard work and practice to just get through those things. And at the start, I think my uninspired days were worse, and now my uninspired days are better. They're not great. They're still not great, but they're not as embarrassing as they used to be. Um, but you're still gonna have them. You know, it's work. It is work. Um, and you're not like in like total enlightenment on top of the mountain, just like letting art just flow through you the entire time. Um, sometimes it's just like, man, I hate this idea. Sometimes you hate it. Like you actually hate, you're like, this idea sucks, you know? Um, and you just gotta buckle down. Deadlines are very motivating. You know what I mean? Like just a true hard deadline and nothing like it. <laughs> it's like, all right, that's it, Friday. This is it. This get done today, one way or another, and it's done when the day when the sun sets. Like, and that's that's it, and then it's over, um, and that's the best you can do. And I think it's just understanding that both of these things are you, and it's like everyone has both. You know, even artists who you think are always up here, you know, like they have these days too. They're just not posting them on Instagram, you know, and these. It's not like because you have bad days, this is you. You know, it doesn't define you. You're you're both all the time. Um, so press on. You know, just practice. You'll get there. Mm -hmm. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Any more? Uh, Me. All right. Go. Me. All right. You. <laughs> um, so I had more questions like towards your like personal like style. Like, how do you like start off with, like, designs? Do you start with like a silhouette or like what do you do to like get it started? 
because it's like mm. what I typically get stuck on like really hard. Totally. So starting. Um, uh, yeah. So it, again, it's it's highly dependent on the context. But we're talking about character design. Yes. Character design. Um, so the like I, I keep coming back to it, but the first part is asking questions. It's like so. Where does this fit in the scheme of the game? Like, who are these? So they're pirates. Okay, so where where do they come from? Do you have any answers? Like, where, what kind of, are they like, kind of, you know, J.B. Jones crew kind of nasty pirates? Or are they like, like, what kind of, you know, sort of ascertaining what are the limits on this thing? Uh, where are you coming from? That's that question about, like, which roommate is this? Um, so finding ways to understand that. One of the first things I'll do is I'll just sketch my first impression. It's not necessarily the one you're going to go with, but it's just I want to get the energy out and I want to like make a start on it. So I'll just barf out the first thing, first two things that like come to my head. Um, then I'll somewhere in the process, and it's not always for a clean stacking thing. I'll do a lot of uh, I'll do research and I'll just dive in. So it'll be like time to just hit Pinterest. Hit Google, hit you know the library if needs be. You know, like like um, Pinterest is a really great way to find reference. You can just search for boards, not just individual images. So if you're like, man, I don't know where to get like um, tribal Maori kind of a traditional costume. You know, there are people who have collected like whole buckets of it and they just put them on Pinterest, and you can just go in and find this huge thing. Um, and so, boom, there you go, and we're off with Moana. You know, like you can start these things somewhere. Uh, so just pulling stuff from all over the place, trying to think about it. I'll, I have a network of friends uh, from art school who have different interests and, and specialties. So sometimes I'll get a piece where it's like, oh, I don't know how to do this. Like it's elves and they're like very fashion, you know? And so I'll reach out to my friends who are in apparel, who, uh, you know, who work in New York and work in fashion. I'm like, designers who do elf-like things, like give me some names. And they'll hit me with some names and then I'll just like fill a folder, you know? Just go on a deep dive and try and, uh, bring as much of that together as possible. And then I'll take that first impression and I'll start to sort of shift it to in light of that new reference. Um, silhouettes can be really good. Uh, I'll do a lot of loose sketches up front though, uh, trying to not get too caught up in the details and just move quickly through ideas. And then I'll take a look at those loose sketches, find like three to five of them, put them all up and then lower the opacity and sketch over those a little bit more. Um, the core thing is like figuring out how to find the theme that's close to the heart of the character and bring that to the surface um, as much as possible. So a recent character design assignment I had was to do a character who is like a, a time traveling hero who has like a, the whole theme of the project was time. Um, and so we were like doing all this stuff and he had armor and pelts and all kinds of different things on him. Um, and finally, it wasn't working. It didn't have that moment where it clicked. And finally, I just went crazy a little bit. I was just like, all right, that's it. Giant clock. Just a, It's just got a big clock on his chest. That's it. And they're like, no. And I was like, but yes, but hold on. And then a few iterations after that, we had solved the character completely. And it was about taking that theme and using the clock motif and finding a way to work it into the design elsewhere and in a different way, um, but like in a big obvious silhouette changing way that really nailed the design and, and got us home. But I had done like 50 different drawings before that <laughs> for this client that were not landing. Um, but they were all building towards that moment when it was finally like, let's just pull the core theme out. Music, you know, oh, this character is a musical, they attack with music, let's pull that out. Let's give them like the biggest flute ever that shoots magic, you know, like you're just trying to find, you know, a crossbow is like a harp, is it not? Um, things like that, so ways you can combine those ideas and find a, a key thing to grab onto, and those can be really powerful ways to unlock a character. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, that's time for one final question, if anyone wants to step up. One last question. Do you have a question, Oh, Do you have a question for us? I do have a question. Uh, hi. 
So, hi. I've been, <laughs> I've been a bit a fan of your work since like forever. Like I remember the first time finding your stuff, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so bright and colorful and amazing. And I really love the way you do like things. So I was just curious. Just it's another um, question about your process. How do you typically go about like? setting the mood of your piece like how do you typically go about the colors and the lighting if that's okay to yeah uh, awesome. totally i mean with techniques stuff uh, oh can we yeah with techniques stuff it's um yeah that's a bit trickier because it's it, it's easier to demonstrate um i have put together some color video stuff um that i might be able to share with you guys but um color and mood it relates to getting to the heart of that concept. Um, I guess I think about things now more in terms of painting the light rather than the thing. Um, I've gotten really into... Um, I keep returning to Mike Mignola and N.C. Wyeth. Yeah. You guys know both? Yeah. Y'all are in art school, y'all better know both. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Wait, did he just pull Hellboy like up out of the desk? Is that what just happened in the background there? <laughs> yeah. It was good. All right, cool. I like that moment. Um, uh, yeah, both of those guys. I got my. I'm like looking for it on my own desk. Um, <laughs> both of the like the it's it's what they don't show too. You know, that's part of the 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 beauty of what they do. Mike Mignola, like his style is not. If you look at other comics versus his, he lets so much of the characters fall completely into shadow, you know, and just into silhouette. And he's very confident and bold with like the the, the shapes that he uses in faces and in bodies, and and graphically designing things to sort of like fall away. And he uses one big shadow to just sweep across things and just kind of abstract it where it's not important. And he drives your focus. And see, Wildlife does the same thing, but with oil paint. Um, he he uses clouds and dust and atmospheric perspective and light and stuff like that to funnel your attention like right where it's supposed to be. Um, so I really like to think about things in terms of light, but also in terms of focus. Um, the prettiness comes kind of along the way, out of practice, out of just like your own tastes and stuff that you've been sort of working on over time. Um, but it's it's most important to me that it it is clear. You know, like what you should look at and not what you should. You know, if I hand you a character design and you're just staring at their feet, like, <laughs> unless their whole point is that their feet are important, you know, then maybe I need to sort of reconsider how I, I arrived at that design. Um, and just the technique. So it's like, you know, if, it, if the clock, if the time motif is like, the most important thing, then that should get the most visual emphasis, you know? Um, and you can play with how that works uh, in silhouette or in color and stuff like that, but a lot of my color and process is focused around trying to direct the eye to the most important conceptual part of the drawing. Um, and then just the color and mood, that just comes from like being so you just react to things like you get sick and tired of seeing so many like grim vaguely beige vaguely blue kind of you know i uh, honestly i was drawing sort of all this sort of classic i love lord of the rings was like this huge influence on me uh world of warcraft i had a face for sure i went on and did this mmo project but out of that i was just like man like there are there's a whole food group I'm not even touching right now, you know. Like I need, and that's what Jelly Butts came out of was just like I am done with brown and leather and grit and scratches, which I come back to all the time. But I need like <laughs> I need the colors that I love when I walk into a froyo place. That's what I want when when I when I go when I'm watching, you know. I don't know. I, was, I keep playing the Cowboy Bebop intro in the background while I draw Jelly Bots things just because I... Ba -ba 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 -ba, and it just colors, 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 silhouette. Um, it's just visually powerful and it has so little to do with like when I'm like drawing like, oh, my sword, like, <laughs> oh, my rune sword with my elf fur. And, like, love that. Love that stuff too. And for that, I put on different music. I get in a different mood. I feed. I watch different cartoons. You know, I, I, I put on like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> but even just setting the tone for yourself, you know, even just throwing on a soundtrack. There was like a moment in the Dawn Gate Chronicles when like I had to draw this like, her town was burning down and she found her brother dead and there's wolves and there's fire and it, she's like, <sighs> and 
I literally played, I found the three hour YouTube loop of the Attack on Titan theme song. Yeah. And that's it. That was my evening. Like, it was like, and that was just, that was it. I needed to like channel that emotional energy to like find the right red <laughs> and the right like scream crying, you know, and Attack on Titan got me there. So, music can be really good, setting the tone, you know. So, does that help? Yeah, yeah it helps yeah. tremendously. Thank you so much. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> oh man. But okay, that's all the time we have right now. No. Just want to a special thanks once again to our amazing guest, Nicholas Cole. Woo! Thank you guys, you guys are great. This is really fun. Awesome. Nice. Super Thank glad you. you enjoyed it. Thanks for giving us your time. We appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. You know, it's a definitely. huge thing, and we won't keep you any longer, so hope you have a great rest of your day and rest of everything else. <laughs> <laughs> likewise, likewise. And if you guys have any other questions, feel free to chase me down on the internet. All right, yeah. <laughs> we'll find you. Well, it's going to be for the YouTube part, but yeah. Your Twitter is going to be at from Happy Rock, and people can find you art station slash Nicholas Cole. I'm well, art station uh, Instagram. Instagram slash Nicholas Cole. Instagram, man. And uh, happyrock.artstation.com. That's, that's right. That's all your credentials. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank guys so much. So much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. All right. Cheers, guys. Yeah,